Thank you all very much for blessing us. Quentin, you can sing, man. I thought that was kind of a joke when I heard it earlier in the week that you were going to be singing. Did your mom and dad know? They do not know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And Quentin, thanks for surprising us this morning. Joel, I appreciate Joel and Robin. They're going to guide us through these next few weeks while Robert's away. He has surgery in the morning in Waco, and uh, he promised to only be away two weeks, but uh, personnel committee met on Monday night, and then I happened to be in the room when the chairman called uh, Robert and told him in very firm terms, as only a banker can do, to take as much time as he needed, that Joel and Robin were going to take care of us, and... Um, and so you be in prayer for Robert. Tomorrow he has his surgery. Cyrus is having surgery tomorrow. You be in prayer for Cyrus as well tomorrow. You have your Bibles this morning. I ask you to turn to 1 John chapter 4. We'll read in a moment beginning in the 7th verse. But Roland Lazenby's recently published biography of Michael Jordan is uh, it's good reading. Really good reading. He describes the complexity of, of Michael Jordan as it equals the complexity of all of us. It was an unknown practice, never publicized at Jordan's demand, that before every Bulls home game, abused, neglected, medically challenged children were brought into the Bulls locker room for 30 minutes of uninterrupted time with him. He was told them, I will build my image on the basketball court. I don't need you exploiting these children. And on one particular evening, they brought a young boy into the locker room who had been burned by his father. His face was skin graft upon skin graft upon skin graft. John Paxson, a shooting guard for the Bulls at the time, said, I could not even speak when I saw the boy. All I could do was cry. Lazenby describes a scene in the locker room where all the Bulls players were crying, the coaches were crying, the front office personnel were in tears, but Jordan sat down next to this disfigured young boy and visited with him for 30 minutes without even the hint of a tear. He said... I think it's part of his ability to focus that he was able to sit down next to this young man and talk about dreams and basketball and what might be someday while everyone else around them is unable to focus. And in a little known move, and I never made this move again, when it came time to go out on the floor, Jordan grabbed the little boy by the hand and he led him out of the locker room and onto the floor of Chicago Stadium put him on the end of the bench. He said, you sit down here and watch the game. Well, during the first time out, an official from the NBA came over and said to the boy, you're going to have to leave. And Jordan saw him taking him out. He stopped him. He said, hey, he sits over here. And they said, no, 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 Michael. It's against league rules for him to be on the bench. And he said, I said, he sits on the bench. And the little boy that no one else could stand to talk to sat on the end of the bench. And during the game, after spectacular shots, Jordan would run by and say, hey, how'd you like that? You have that picture of Michael Jordan. And then there are the other pictures. Treating his teammates with absolute disregard because they were beneath him. Storming out of practices when he disagreed with the coach. Not paying his gambling debts. The women. And he was always able to say to any of his flaws, I'm just too competitive. Looking down on his fellow teammates who are superior athletes as well, he would say, I'm just too competitive to put up with that. 
storming out of the practice saying, I know I shouldn't do that, but I'm just too competitive. I know I ought to pay my gambling debts, but I'm just too competitive to let that money go. His father was asked one time, does Michael have a gambling problem? And he said, no, Michael has a competitor problem. You see in this biography, good and bad. Just like you see in the rest of us. Good and bad. Now, let's begin reading in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love is revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. And we've seen and do testify that the father has sent his son as a savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we've known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of the judgment. Because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they've seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must also love their brothers and their sisters. You've probably picked up in that quick reading there. There's quite a dilemma in this text. And I've wrestled with this dilemma. And I struggled this week with some own dilemmas that came into my own mind. So I just kind of walked around and asked people general Christian, Christian questions. Some of you have been asked these questions this week, so I'm not going to call anybody out by name or your responses. But I asked the question, based on 1 John, can you be a Christian and be cranky? Can you be a Christian and be cranky? You know, I've known some people. You've known some people who are church members Christian people, but they're, they're upset about everything. They're upset with the garbage man. They're upset with the cable company and the phone company and the church and the principal at the school. And they're upset with the chamber of commerce and give them 10 minutes and they'll be upset about something else. And yet they claim to have a vital Christian faith, but John seems to can offer here. That you cannot be Christian and cranky. Verse 7 and 8 again. Beloved, let us love one another. Because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is 
love. So I ask this question. Are we capable of loving everyone? Or can I flip it around? Are there some people who are too difficult to love? A few years ago in Littlefield, a gentleman was killed, murdered in his apartment. And it was written in the Lubbock Avalanche Journal at the time, reporting on the story of this murder in Littlefield, that the sheriff and the police chief knew who the murderer was, but no charges would be filed. They knew who killed the man, but no charges would be filed. So I, the, I asked Judge Young. I said, Judge Young, I read this in the paper, and I'm just curious. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, he had on his suspenders. He rolled his suspenders down, you know, way he get when he started to talk legal, and he put his hands in his belt. He said, well, Dr. Stace. He said, it's a good defense from time to time to prove that some folks need killing. I said, so that's the defense. He said, yeah. He said, every town has them. People nobody can get along with. People nobody will trust. People who did everybody wrong. And sometimes you can prove in court that it was just the right thing to do. Hmm. Good thing I didn't go into the legal profession, I thought. But let me put this to you. You've seen the news this week. How many of you would accept a foreign exchange student from eastern Ukraine wearing a hood and carrying an automatic rifle into your home this semester? How many of you would invite Hamas personnel who have been storing weapons inside United Nations schoolhouses over for Thanksgiving dinner? Is it possible that there are some people who are just too hard to love? Johnson, remember, let me read this to you again. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And what about those folks who just seem to be going through life making one bad choice, one bad decision, one bad choice after another? And they keep knocking on your door when their backs are against the wall from their own poor choices wanting to know if you can come and help them out. Maybe if you could just pay this bill one, one more time. If you could just come give me a ride because I can't take care of my car because I spent my money on something else. Maybe if you would just come help. I know we shouldn't have done it, but we went to Hobbs for a few hours and can you come help us pay our rent? John seems to be pretty clear. If you don't love, you don't know God. And if you do love, it is because you do love God. Last Sunday morning in the first six verses of 1 John 4, it's, I preached a doctrinal sermon. I told Quentin after the service, I said, doctrinal sermons are hard for me to preach because it's basically saying the same thing over and over for 20 minutes. Jesus was the son of God who came into the world as a human. And John said, if you deny that God has come into the world as a human, you're the Antichrist, he says. If you deny that Jesus came into the world in the flesh, you do not know God, he says. 
over and over and over again, it comes out of that text that God, Jesus is 100% human and he is 100% God and his God has sent his son into the world, into the, in the flesh to demonstrate the radical nature of God's love for everybody. And over and over and over again, last Sunday morning, I said that same thing, trying to be a little bit different over and over and over again. Jesus coming in the flesh demonstrates the love of God. Now, there are some who are going to say, Jesus, the God could never touch evil, sinful flesh. There are some people that are so evil, God could never be in their presence. There are some people who are so bad, God would never touch their lives. There's such a filth in this world that God would never touch us. God is too spiritual for the filthy things of this world. And there are some in our world who will say, God is too spiritual and I'm too spiritual. It's not a far leap to say, if God can't touch the, spirit, the flesh of this world, then I who am spiritual cannot touch the flesh of this world either. So I'm not going to have anything to do with these difficult, hard to get along with people that I don't like. I know God too well. I'm going to just stay here by myself. My good friend Curtis Shelburne told me he quoted me in Wednesday night prayer meeting, so here's my turn to quote him back. Curtis told me one time, he said, I'd much rather have a congregation full of sinful reprobates who know they've been saved by grace than a bunch of spiritual people who don't think they have any need for grace. Those are the people whom Paul speaks, John speaks in this passage of Scripture. These people who are so living up in such a spiritual world that they don't want to have to fool with the people who are difficult, who are hard to love. And yet over and over and over in this chapter, John says, those who love, love because of God, because God is love. Now I want to focus for a moment on verse 12, if you'll allow me. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. It's that word perfected. Now, when I hear the word perfected, I think of something that is flawless, faultless, without a blemish. It is symmetrical. It is perfect in every way. In this text right here, you could think of a report card where all the moral clauses are checked with check plus all the way down to the bottom. That person is morally perfect. But the word John uses in this text is not, it's a variation of perfect. He uses the word telos, which means gold. I want to read verse 12 again and use the word goal instead of perfect. Now, no, excuse me, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love reaches its goal in us. This word telos means that God's love is moving through this world. He sent his only son into this world to save us from our sins, to cleanse us of our unrighteousness, and put, he put his love in us. And if we love others, then God's love is reaching its goal. But if we refuse to love others, if we refuse to love the difficult, if we refuse to love those who disagree with us, if we refuse to love those who have a different view of the world than we do, if we refuse to love, then God's love is not reaching its goal. In 1 John, God sent his only son into the world as a demonstration of his love for sinful human flesh. And he's asked us to take his example and to love others. In May of 1972, two 31-year-old parents 
were sitting across the room while the pediatrician examined their newborn son. And the doctor said, do you want to take him home? And the dad said, well, aren't we supposed to? He said, well, this kid's going to have a hard life. He's mongoloid, which in today's medical terms, we would say he has Down syndrome. He said, he's going to have a hard life. It's not going to be easy. He said, if I were y'all, I would give him up, let, let him go into an institution. Maybe somebody would adopt him out of the institution who wants to do something like this. He said, but I wouldn't take him home. He's... It's not going to have a good life. The mama said, we're going to take him home. That was 42 years ago last May. His father writes about his son, John, John Will. He said, John has two wonderful gifts in his life. The first is the subway system in Washington, D.C. That he has learned to memorize that map and its colors and he can help anyone get anywhere with that map in his head. And the second thing that is a blessing to him is the Washington Nationals baseball team. Every day, 81 days a year, he leaves and gets on the subway six or eight hours before the game begins. And he has some chores that he does in the locker room. He picks up towels and he cleans up this and that. And he interacts with the players. And his dad says, what's amazing about it is here's a locker room full of 25 young men who've won the athletic lottery. They have the physical ability to play Major League Baseball. And yet in their midst, there is this 42-year-old young man who did not win any lotteries at all. And he said they treat him with kindness and gentleness and love. He said he's part of the team. 81 days a year, he's part of the team. His dad also writes that the greatest attribute that John has in his life compared to everyone else he knows is serenity. He said he's always serene through any circumstance. He said most people treat him kindly, but said every now and then there's somebody on the subway system that says something ugly to him. Serenity doesn't faze him. He said it didn't bother him when his three younger siblings all grew taller than he did. It didn't bother him when he was six, they were 16. They started driving the cars. It didn't bother him when they left for college. And it didn't bother him when they graduated. He said he's just been serene about everything. But 81 days a year, he tools around the locker room in National Stadium. And then he takes his seat where he cheers for the Nationals and hopes for ruination for whoever they're playing. And he said, this son that the doctor told us not to take home has taught us how to love and how to be loved by God's grace. John says, if you have been loved by God, love everyone else too. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the challenges of John's word. For the doctrine of last week, that laid the foundation of your radical love for us. And now these challenging words asking us to love others. Father, I pray 
that in the give and take and the in and out of the circumstances of our lives, people might see the love of Christ in us. That they might see patience. That they might see forgiveness. That the world would see kindness in us. That the world might see a serenity that we live in your love and we're passing it along. Father, help us to take the love you've put in us and to show it to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to have a hymn of invitation and I encourage you to come this morning. If you've accepted Christ as Savior, you come. Join with us. If you're here looking for a church home, come and join with us as we seek to be the love and the presence of Christ in this world. Father, I ask that you help us in every way. And may we be the people of love in this community. Let's stand and let's sing together.